Welcome and welcome back. We are here for what I believe is the fifth episode in the read-along for uh, Leonardo by Walter Isaacson. Um, this is a bit of a strange chapter. We're going to break uh, chapter three up into two parts, just like we did chapter two. Uh, but a bit of a strange chapter at the beginning. We're all over the place. A little bit of personal stuff, a little bit of professional stuff, a little bit of the artist's life, as it were. So basically what I'm going to do here is pages uh, 68 through 81. And we're going to essentially take this chronologically as it happens in the book. Uh, I imagine there is an actual word for chronologically when it does not mean by time, but it means by pages in a book. I assume there's probably a word in the English language for that, but I do not know it. Uh, I want to start right up here with uh, the very first few paragraphs, which read as such. In April 1476, a week before his 24th birthday, Leonardo was accused of engaging in sodomy with a male prostitute. It happened around the time that his father finally had another child, a legitimate son who would become his heir. The anonymous allegation against Leonardo was placed in, tam in a tamburo, one of the letter drums designated for receipt of morals charges, and involved a 17-year-old named Jacop Jacopo Saltarelli who worked in a nearby goldsmith shop. He, quote, dresses in black, end quote. The accuser wrote of Saltarelli, quote, is party to many wretched affairs and consents to please those persons who request such wickedness of him, end quote. Four young men were accused of engaging in his, engaging his sexual services, among them Leonardo di Ser Piero de la, da Vinci. De la Vinci. Da Vinci who lives with Andrea de Verrocchio. Um, the officers of the night who policed such charges launched an investigation and may have imprisoned Leonardo and the others for a day or so. The, chargers, the charges could have led to serious criminal penalties if any witnesses were willing to come forward. Fortunately, one of the four young men who was a member of a prominent family that had married into the Medici clan, the case was dismissed, quote, with the condition that no further accusations be made, end quote. But a few weeks later, a new accusation was made, this one written in Latin. It said that the four engaged in multiple sexual engagements with Saltarelli. Because it, was too anon because it too was an anonymous allegation and no witnesses came forth to corroborate it, the charges were once again set aside with the same conditions. That, apparently, was the end of the matter. Thirty years later, Leonardo wrote a bitter comment in a notebook. Quote, when I made a Christ child, you put me in prison. And now, if I show him grown up, you will do worse to me. End quote. The comment is cryptic. Perhaps Saltarelli had modeled for one of his depictions of a young Jesus. At the time, Leonardo felt abandoned. Quote, as I have told you before, I am without any of my friends. End quote. He wrote in a note. On the reverse of this, quote, if there is no love, what then? End quote. Leonardo was romantically and sexually attracted to men, and, unlike Michelangelo, seemed to be just fine with that. He made no effort to either hide or proclaim it, but, pr but it probably contributed to his sense of being unconventional, someone who wasn't geared to be a part of, family procession of no a family procession of notaries. Um, make no mistake about it, this accusation was made by someone who was attempting to absolutely end Leonardo. These accusations could have uh, dire consequences for anyone uh, amongst whom they were alleged. Um, physical harassment, physical violence, uh, criminal charges, imprisonment, um, loss of jobs, loss of friends, being basically expelled from anyone you know. Um, in fact, it says here on page 71, it could mean these charges could have meant prison, exile, or even death. So those, those are three big ones. Those are three pretty big things that could happen to you simply for being alleged to have, uh, to have participated in quote-unquote sodomy. Um, we get this quote on 70. Well, just a little bit more about that. There is not 
there never was, nor will there ever be, a shortage of cretins in society willing, because they don't like you, to try to have you canceled, as opposed to just leaving you alone, ignoring you, walking away. Uh, the fact that someone so brilliant and so important to culture and the human experience as Leonardo faced something such as this um, should be startling, should be sobering, should prompt each of us to go into those places of our own souls uh, that not only might be canceled, but also... I don't believe that any of us is without some sort of prompting in this direction. I think that everyone is on occasion um, subject to the whimsy that might, oh, I hope this person, this happens to this person, this happens to that person. I think it's necessary that we always catch ourselves in these small moments, um, no matter what someone has done to you, no matter where you find yourself. And try to find the humanity in yourself. If, fuck that other person, then fuck that other person. Fuck them. Don't let that make you a different person. Um, on 70, Leonardo was never known to have had a relationship with a woman. And he occasionally recorded his distaste for the idea of heterosexual copulation. He wrote in one of his notebooks, quote, the sexual act of coitus and the body parts employed for it are so repulsive that if it were not for the beauty of the faces and the adornment of the actors and the pent-up impulse, nature would lose the human species. That's some strong language. That is some strong language. Um, and we have on the kissing page to this, page 71, this comes to us from uh, the narrative itself. A 1484, this is about, just, a 1484 papal bull likens sodomy to, quote, carnal knowledge with demons, end quote. Being homosexual is the same thing they're saying here as having carnal knowledge with demons. This reminds me of, I think it's a Joe Rogan joke that says all of these people who are super weird about gay people, uh, they're that way. They're very standoffish to gay people and gay sex because uh, they're terrified. Penis must be delicious. Tell me that's not what that sounds like. Tell me that joke is not exactly what it sounds like to say uh, that that. Men having sex is the same thing as carnal knowledge with demons. Tell me that's not the same thing. Sounds like it to me. Um, also, on... The, so, we're talking about someone with an incredible imagination. And this comes to us... On the contrary, in his life and in his notebooks, there is much evidence that he was not ashamed of his sexual desires. Instead, he seemed amused by them. In a section of his notebooks on, called On the Penis, he described quite humorously how the penis had a mind of its own and acted at times without the will of the man. Quote, the penis sometimes displays an intellect of its own. When a man may desire it to be stimulated, it remains obstinate, and it goes its own way, sometimes moving on its own without the permission of its owner. Whether he is awake or sleeping, it does what it desires. Often, when the man wishes to use it, it desires otherwise, and often it wishes to be used, and the man forbids it. Therefore, it appears, in his cre it, it appears that this creature possesses a life and an intelligence separate from the man. I think we've all been there. Uh, in quote. So, he found it curious that the penis was often a source of shame and that men were shy about discussing it. Quote, man is wrong to be ashamed of giving it a name or showing it. End quote. He added, quote, always covering and concealing something that deserves to be adorned and displayed with ceremony. End quote. Um, 
Leave it to an Italian to be so open about sex, right? Am I right? But I think that this is uh, emblematic of the fact that I, I think that a lot of that seems so strange to hear in today's world because especially, possibly especially recently, um, sex seems cordoned off. Sexuality seems cordoned off. It seems to be uh, something which is so very restrictive because it must be repulsive. That is not what Leonardo is saying. Well, we just got that quote from Leonardo saying that heterosexual sex is disgusting. Um, but it is. this is, uh, all in all, a different attitude towards sex and sexuality, I think, than we have today. Uh, for better or worse, whatever you want to say. We get this later on. Oh, right. Going back to these charges that were levied against him, this was someone trying to absolutely end Leonardo. First off, all the consequences and repercussions that the charges themselves may have had. But we get we get further um, we get further explication of what these consequences would have meant in Leonardo's life from the surrounding fact about his life that his father now had fathered an heir. So there was nothing left for Leonardo. If these things had gone against Leonardo, um, he would have been absolutely destitute because there was nothing left for him to fall back on, especially because I think it was earlier in this biography it was noted that a notary might lose employ himself simply for being in the company of a homosexual. Um, so yeah, on, on 72 here. On a deeper level, Leonardo's homosexuality seems to have been manifest in his sense of himself as somewhat different, an outsider who didn't quite fit in. By the time he was 30, his increasingly successful father was an establishment insider and a legal advisor to the Medici, the top guilds and churches. He was also an exemplar of traditional masculinity. By then, he had at least one mistress, three wives, and five children. Leonardo, on the contrary, was essentially an outsider. The birth of his step-siblings reinforced the fact that he was not considered legitimate. As a gay, illegitimate artist twice accused of sodomy, he knew what it was like to be regarded and to, be, and to regard yourself as different. But as with many artists, that turned out to be more an asset than a hindrance. Um, I think that if you if you make any study of the most successful people through history, if you make any study of individuals who are masters in any field, um, especially a field in which you are interested because you might be drawn further to uh, sort of look into what made these people themselves, what made these people successful in that field, it is overtly evident time and time again that one of the things that contributes to people being successful, um, especially people who are successful on the level of mastery, is that they're a little off, at least a little off. And probably, probably you would not want to know them. Probably it would be difficult to know them because individuals who reach that level of success or expertise are incredibly different. Um, moving on to... Oh, did I forget something here? No. Uh, 74. The... Um, under the heading Adoration of the Magi, which is one of his unfinished works, um, it's something which is going to pop up, I believe, time and again. This is the Adoration of the Magi. I'm a kindergarten teacher. You see that, children? You see that, class? Uh, that is the unfinished Adoration of the Magi. We learn here about this 
In the accusations against him, Leonardo was described as living in Verrocchio's workshop. He was 24, and most former apprentices would have flown their master's nest by then. But Leonardo was not only still living with his teacher, but he was producing Madonnas so lacking in distinctiveness that it is hard to tell whether they were painted by him or someone else in that workshop. Perhaps prodded by the Saltarelli affair, Leonardo finally broke away and opened a workshop of his own in 1477. Commercially, it was a failure. During the subsequent five years, before he headed off to Milan, he would receive only three known commissions, one of which he never started, and the other two were left unfinished. Nevertheless, even two unfinished paintings would be enough to enhance his reputation and influence the practice of art. What we learned there. Leonardo finally goes off on his own, decides to start a business, decides to start his own studio. He gets three jobs. Three people come to him and say, hey, I want you to paint this for me. Three people said, hey, I got a job for you. One of those people got nothing. Leonardo didn't even start it. Didn't even pay him the time of day. Said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. Never did. Two of them. He started and never finished. Of those three, two were attempted. Of those two, neither were finished. Of those two, neither of which being finished, one of them was so grandiose, was going to be so game-changing, that not only from an unfinished work. So remember, Leonardo's 0 for 3. He's batting 0. But one of those attempts, one of those times he stepped up to the plate, that empty swing was so pretty that he went into the Hall of Fame. Think of it that way. The Adoration of Ma the Magi... Adoration of the Magi. So game-changing. Even though it's unfinished, that Leonardo, from it, became semi-legend. This reminds me a little bit of, um, as strange as it might sound, Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson is still argued by some to be the greatest running back who ever lived. Bo Jackson played, I think, two or three seasons, and his career was cut short by what was at the time a career-ending hip injury. 1991? 1990? 1991? Uh, his career was cut short by basically sort of popping the hip out. Uh, during a tackle, he, his hip was popped out of socket and then went back in socket um, to devastating effect, and he was never able to run as he had. Uh, he is argued by some to be the greatest running back of all time, despite the fact that he didn't really get to accomplish much. That's what this is like. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, didn't really finish all that much. But by God, it looked so good when he tried it. Um, we get further on 74. There is no evidence that he started work, that he started on the work. However, some of the sketches were inspirations for a painting that he soon began on a related theme, the Adoration of the Magi, which is the one I showed you. Um, it was destined to remain unfinished, but it became the most influential unfinished painting in the history of art and, in the, in the words of Kenneth Clark, quote, the most revolutionary and anti-classical picture of the 15th century, end quote. The Adoration of the Magi thus encapsulates Leonardo's frustrating genius, a path-breaking and astonishing display of brilliance that was abandoned once it was conceptualized. Um, so it seems Leonardo needed a fire lit under his ass. 
We get this from page 77. Leonardo was often critical of Botticelli, whose version of an Annunciation scene painted in 1481 was probably what prompted Leonardo to write, quote, I recently saw an Annunciation in which the angel looked as if she wished to chase Our Lady out of the room with movement of such violence that she might have been a hated enemy, and Our Lady seemed in such despair that she was about to throw herself out of the window, end quote. Leonardo later noted correctly that Botticelli, quote, makes very dull landscapes, end quote, and lacking a feel for aerial perspective, painted both close and distant trees the same shade of green. This is what we needed, a little bit of taste of rivalry. Um, one thing that um, I think is often lost in today's shit-talking society is that it used to be when you talked shit, you were expected to back it up. Otherwise, you had to face the social consequences. Um, and because of that, there was an innovative quality of spite and of shit-talking. Uh, it used to be, you better figure it out. If you talked all that mess, you'd better figure it out. And because you'd better figure it out, oftentimes you were forced to try new things. Uh, this is how a lot of rivalries in art go. Um, there is a bit about the rivalry between Ernest Hemingway and, um, oh, damn it. How am I blanking on his name? Where are we at here? William Faulkner. Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner. Um, whereby William Faulkner said something about Ernest Hemingway always using such plain language and such small words. And Hemingway retorted, oh, poor William still thinks that the best literature comes from 10 cent words. Uh, something to that effect. I'm not quoting it exactly, but something to that effect. And um, so, because that those things were said, Ernest Hemingway had to find a way to filter such great art through simpler and simpler language. Otherwise, he would be seen as giving in to pluck out Faulkner's 10 cent words. By the same token, William Faulkner, if you pay attention to a lot of his writing, he would use Hemingwayan, in fact, he would use Hemingwayan type language from time to time to really punctuate things. But he was seen, um, he is still heralded, uh, instead of a minimalist, as a maximalist. Uh, he would take very simple things and stretch them into very big things, thereby making the character's world the biggest thing, thereby making the character's truth what we have to interpret. Versus Hemingway, who did things so very calmly and so very distantly, as to say, I am presenting the truth, the actual truth of what is going on, and I'm making you pick out the character's truths. Here is an example of uh, William Faulkner using Hemingwayan language. If I get that in there, oh, it's backwards anyway, that sucks. It is a chapter from As I Lay Dying where Vardaman, a child, the entire chapter is my mother is a fish. It's the entire chapter. Um, that is an example of William Faulkner using some Hemingway type language. Uh, but that is all I have for this episode. I hope to see you back next week as we take on part two of chapter three for episode six in this series. <laughs>